קל העיכוב. זה מפריע למישהו אם אני מדבר באנגלית? או שאני יכול... לא, לא מפריע לאף אחד. אוקיי. תודה. לא? אוקיי, סורי את המיקרופון. אני מלואייר, אני עובד איתך על ארנון. אני רואה שהחלקים הפרטים הם יותר מעניינים לאנשים מאשר החלקים הפרטים. אני עושה הרבה עבודה בטכנולוגיה ובלאה, וזו לקטורה תהיה על בלאה, ובסייבר סיקיורטי אינדסטרי בישראל. וספציפיקלי, זה יהיה על איך הבלאה בישראל is very different, in, uh, very different in uh, certain respects than the law in the rest of the world. In fact, Israel is very unique in uh, certain aspects of cybersecurity law. So, in this lecture, I'll talk a little bit about the law. I'll talk a little bit about specific cases so that to illustrate what the law is. And I'll try and give some practical tips about what people in the industry can do. Um, That's what I'll give you. What, the reason I'm here, um, what I'm somewhat expecting, what I hope to get from the audience, is, um, is uh, this is an interesting field for me. I wrote a paper about it. It would be very interesting for me if, uh, if someone could give me examples of whether, or even maybe, maybe this difference in Israeli law has no impact on the industry. But if it does, and if uh, you've perhaps encountered this in your professional career, It would be very, very interesting to me um, if you could explain, if you could give me examples of how this has affected you, these differences in Israeli law. So here we go. Okay. So when we talk about law that impacts cybersecurity, there's basically three kinds, three kinds of laws. There's hacking laws, right? Hacking laws. And what hack, anti-hacking laws that talk about preventing hacking, basically what they do is, um, is they say, don't hack into someone else's computer. Don't hack into, uh, if there's a network, don't hack into the network. Don't, uh, don't try and uh, hack into someone else's computer. Don't get information that doesn't belong to you. That's what these kind of laws are meant to do. Um, and there's the Chokam Achshavim in Israel, the computer law. In uh, the United States, there's um, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act in the United States. And there's lots of laws in the United States. Every state has its own law. There's a federal law. Europe has its uh, cybercrime laws, and there's international treaties, and uh, et cetera, and et cetera. There's the International Cybercrime Convention. But basically, you know, there's a lot of words here. The whole point of all of these laws is to say, don't hack into someone else's computer in five words. Um, but they use a lot of words to say it. That's the point of those laws. Then there's laws about intellectual property. And intellectual property, it's similar to the anti-hacking laws, and the, the point of those laws is to say, don't use someone else's, not their physical property, but their intellectual property. So those kind of laws are, you know, often we talk about in, uh, um, in, uh, in, in when, it, when we come to computers, the most relevant are often copyright laws or laws about reverse engineering. And these laws are, copy, are, are relevant not only in, uh, in about, in, about they're, they're not only laws inside Israel, and uh, in every other country, in Europe, in the United States, but there's also international treaties about intellectual property, and these laws are very standardized across the world. And basically, again, the point is, don't use someone else's property. And then there's a third kind of law, which is very common in the world, and it's anti-circumvention law. And anti-circumvention law, it doesn't talk about, you know, it, it can, can relate to someone else's computer or someone else's network or someone else's property, but it also relates to your own property. So for example, um, when Apple says, don't jailbreak your iPhone, right, and they, uh, and they threaten you with, uh, with lawsuits, or if someone distributes um, technology to jailbreak an iPhone and they threaten you with lawsuits, so what, what kind of laws can they sue you? They can't sue you against hacking, with hacking laws because we're talking about an iPhone that you bought, it's yours. They can't sue you with intellectual property laws. Again, um, you bought the iPhone. You're not, you're not copying anything. You're not distributing anything. You're only hacking into your own iPhone. What can they sue you with? What are they threatening you with? They're threatening you with more, more or less, most of the time, with anti-circumvention laws, which talks about ha hacking into your own 
computers. So those are the kind of laws that we're talking about today. Um, and, and again, so what, what, what do anti-circumvention laws talk about? They prohibit breaking digital locks like we talked about, jailbreaking into your iPhone or uh, circumventing, uh, um, uh, well, here's a list. So basically, so content encryption, um, any kind of content encryption, so music that keeps the music in a certain ecosystem, or ebooks that means you can only use it on certain readers, or music which keeps it on a certain, uh, cer cer uh, on certain devices. If you circumvent any of those uh, systems, that, that those digital rights management systems, then you are breaching these, these kind of anti-circumvention laws, even though, even though it's your own device, or your own computer and the music that you purchased, even though you're doing that, um, that's what those kind of laws are meant to pro prohibit. Um, and then there's lots of other things that they can prohibit. So anti authentication handshakes, so when you're, there, you're confirming that the other side is who you think it is, if you secu or hardware security, if you modify the security inside a hardware device so that you can use it for, for matters that you weren't supposed to use it for, that's also breaking these laws and code signing, all these things are basically um, breaches of anti-circumvention law. Um, and what's the point? Originally, originally, when these kind of laws were started being, th these kind of laws started being uh, enacted in around 1999, 1998, 1999, and and the original uh, intent of these laws, these kind of laws, these anti-circumvention laws, was to prohibit privacy. Uh, pr uh, to, uh, not digital privacy, sorry. I meant to see piracy, right? So, so stealing someone else's um, 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 content. So you bought a CD and the CD, and you're only supposed to use it on this kind of computer, or only supposed to use it in the United States and not in Europe, or you're not supposed to copy it. And people circumvent that, and they 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 break the encryption on the disk, and so they use it in the wrong area, or they use it in the or or they copy it, and they send it to people that they're not supposed to send it to. Um, Originally, these laws were meant to stop those kind of actions. Um, and they were also meant to enable certain kind of business models, like the fact that you can stream video. And the intent was, I don't know if this really came to pass, but the intent was that you could have business models that said, well, stream video, you'll pay for it. And we'll have these, you know, these um, measures around it that prohibit you from, that stop you from copying the content. And if you somehow circumvent that and manage to copy the content, then you're breaking the law. and. Uh, and we can see you, I guess. And this, I don't know how much this ever really came to pass, but that's what those, these were the original intentions, the uh, purposes of these laws. But they've, they've gone much beyond that. And here's just in the United States, the United States is just a good example, but these laws are all over the world. And the United States says no person shall circumvent, right? You can't get around la, la COF. It's a technological measure that effectively controls access to a copyrighted work. So if you have a work, an ebook or some music or something like that, and you circumvent, the uh, protection that stops you from copying it or that stops you from distributing it, then that's a pr that, that you're violating this law. It's you're violating the anti-circumvention law. But it's not just the action that's prohibited. It's also, uh, so not just the fact of circumvention is prohibited, but also the trafficking, the trafficking in tools that are used for circumvention. So if someone develops code, um, some kind of software tool, that aids in circumvention, and you start selling it over the internet, or you offer it for sale, then that's also a violation of these laws. So you can't, you can't circumvent the 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 the, the access controls, and you can't um, start distributing code that allows someone else to circumvent the access tools. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a good point. We'll, we'll talk later, but it's a, it's a good point. But basically, the effectively doesn't doesn't mean anything. That's what that's what they've that's what they've decided. But it's a good point. Um, so these laws are all over the world, right? So w will the U.S. S we'll get there in one second. We'll get there in one second. That's right, but if you somehow and there are people that not with uh, not with not with Kindles yet there aren't any cases about it, but there are cases with other formats of eBooks that someone gets around the copy protection and, for example, turns it into a PDF and then sells it, 
then then they can be a Uh, <laughs> um, so, so, so some cases where the, this this came up in court. So jailbreaking, right? So jailbreaking an iPhone, I already said, is a problem under these laws. Um, but we're not going to talk about jailbreaking an iPhone. There was a case in I think 2011 where this guy George Hotsey he posted uh, keys and code for jailbreaking the PlayStation, PlayStation 3. Um, and now I, I looked on. GitHub and there's lots of code for jailbreaking PlayStations, but this was a big deal. It seems like in 2011, and he posted it. And what happened? Um, Sony sued um, this man individually under under these laws. The DMCA is what the laws are called in the United States. They sued him personally and they brought him to court. And I think there was even a criminal trial um, because he posted these keys. And then Sony went to court and they got the IP addresses of everyone that ever downloaded the code from the internet. So they were very, uh, they were really running after these people. Anyone that, because they, they got the, 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 the IP addresses of anyone that downloaded the, the code because they wanted to show that, that he had actually caused some damage in the United States. So they got all those IP addresses and they sued him. And I think uh, in, the end, in the end, they came to some settlement and I forgot exactly what the settlement was, but uh, they probably offered him a job. But, <laughs> but, uh, but that was, that <laughs> he declined? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then, then more interesting, they. Uh, um, I don't know if it was him, but the code itself, the code, the the jailbreaking code, was posted on GitHub and Gitorius. So, uh, and Sony sent them both uh, letters, both to GitHub and to Gitorius. Gitorius doesn't exist anymore, but then it was posted there, and they sent them both letters. Take it down. Take down the code. If you don't take down the code, we're going to sue you because you are in effect. Um, distributing um, these uh, these uh, these keys, the, these uh, this code that allows people to circumvent to jailbreak the the PlayStation, and we can sue you, so you have to take it down. Um, and they did; they took it down because they were scared. Um, Gitorius doesn't exist anymore, but it's not in the United States. GitHub is in the United States; its servers are in the United States, but Gitorius its servers were in Norway. So they answered, uh, you know, like like someone asked me about outside the United States. Gitoris was in Norway, and they uh, and they answered, "We're not in the United States. You can't sue us under the American laws." So thank you very much. We're going to keep it up there. And then Sony, who has a lot of lawyers, they wrote back to them. They found, you know, I said these laws are all over the world. They said, no, even in Norway there are laws like that that you can't distribute code that uh, that circumvents um, protection. And so um, so you have to take it down. And Gatoris took it down, and you would think that this code would no longer be available, but like I said, you can do a search, and I think you can find it now anyway. So it wasn't so successful, but Sony pursued this very aggressively. So that's one case. That's one case. Um, another case where this came up is, uh, is in car hacking. So uh, car hacking has recently gone into the news a lot. Um, so for example, Volkswagen. Right, everyone knows about the scandal with Volkswagen where they put this defeat device into the emissions and it controlled the emissions so they could pass the emissions test. Um, no, one, no one really discovered the code for that. No one ever found the code that did it. What happened is that Volkswagen, um, there were these emissions testers that were testing the car. They were trying to see what comes out of the car, what comes out when it's tested, what comes out when it's on the road, what comes out in these conditions, and they found out that they were very different, um, very different emissions depending on where the car was. So eventually, um, the authorities in the United States went to Volkswagen. They said, what's up? And after a long process, Volkswagen eventually volunteered. They told them that this was really a software issue, and it was the code that had changed the emissions of the device. But no one ever found the code. No one ever independently examined the car to find the code. And um, a lot of researchers and organizations in the United States said that the reason no one ever looked for the code, no one ever tried to take this apart, was because of these laws. Because if you bought a Volkswagen and you started taking apart the code and you started looking for it and you started hacking the car, then 
there was a real possibility. Or and and if you started publishing the code, or start part of started publishing the way that you were eventually circumventing these things in the car that 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 stopped you from getting access to the code, then you would be sued under these laws. And so. Um, they said that, that this was a big problem. One of the reasons why no one ever found the code and why it took so many years, I think seven years, for this, uh, this issue to be discovered was because, was because of these laws. So what happened? Um, it turns out that in um, October of last year, um, the Copyright Office in the United States was trying to look for exemptions. They, every three years, they, look for, they, 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 they say that there are certain exemptions to the law. And one of these um, exemptions, it turned out, which they granted, was, uh, was now you can... Uh, examine cars, you can hack the software and the cars for security issues. And one of the big reasons that they granted this exemption was because of all of these scandals that people ended up hacking Jeeps and, Volks, uh, and Jeeps and other cars, and also because they showed that, you know, the car companies always said that you shouldn't have this exemption for cars. Why? Because then people will hack the cars and they'll make the emissions, they, and you know, they'll hack the cars so that they increase the performance of the cars and the, they'll, they'll bypass the emissions control laws. Turned out that it was exactly the opposite, that, that, that the car companies were bypassing the emission control laws, and people were actually looking for the software that allows them to do that. So eventually they said, there's an exemption, um, you don't have to, uh, this law doesn't apply for car hacking. So if you want to car hack a car in the United States, you can probably do it now. Um, but it doesn't apply, this only applies to you yourself hacking the car. It doesn't apply. So if someone would develop tools for hacking a car, you could still get sued under that. And there were two cases just this year about this company, Autel, that, that developed um, software for servicing vehicles, right? So you bought a GM car, you bought a Ford car, and you didn't want to go to the, the, the dealership because it was very expensive. You wanted to go to someone cheaper. So they got this all this cheap software that you could use to diagnose and fix the Ford and the GM cars. And uh, Ford and GM sued them because how did they get? How did they develop the software? They only developed it by uh, by circumventing the controls inside the vehicles. So, and, and then by distributing that software to to dealerships. So in the United States now, what happens is that you can hack your own car, but you can't distribute software for uh, for hacking cars or for examining the security issues in this. Anyway, so all of this was a roundabout way of saying that. Hacking some, a device, hacking an iPhone or hacking a phone or anything to find out the security problems in the, in the, the device, um, even if it's only for security purposes, or even if it's only to find the bugs or the, the vulnerabilities in the, the device, is still a problem legally in many jurisdictions. It can still be a problem. You can still, um, um, f you can still violate the laws that are about these issues. Now, um, this is a problem for security companies that look for vulnerabilities for professionals that try and do pen testing or things like that. They, they, have to be, they have to be aware of these issues and they have to get the right permissions and they have to make sure that they're doing, uh, they're doing this legally. So th there's been a lot of concerns, even when the laws were first developed, that these kind of laws um, are, are problematic and they can stop people from doing security research. So what happened? <laughs> The law started, uh, we, they started adding exemptions to the law. There are exemptions for, 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 for security testing and for encryption and for reverse engineering. There are all these exceptions to the law that say, even though in general you can't hack your own device, you are allowed to do security testing. You are allowed to do encryption research. You can do reverse engineering. But these exceptions are very complicated. So for example, this is the security testing exemption. It's very complicated. It's not an easy exception. Um, so even though there are exceptions, they're complicated, and these laws still apply to a lot of activities, so people should be aware of them. Um, and this came up just last week. Just last week, there was a, a, a case of medical device hacking, which didn't really involve these laws, but it's worth talking about for a second. There was the case, maybe people heard about it, the St. Jude's device, right? They, they make, they make uh, heart pacemakers, right? And um, MedSec is a company that found security problems inside the pacemakers. MedSec gave the security information to Muddy Waters, and Muddy Waters, what did they do? They sold the stock of St. Jude's, and it fell. So they made a million. They they made I think 50 million dollars just because just because they found cybersecurity problems in pacemakers, and they and by selling the stock. What happens if you're St. Jude's? What's the first thing you do? So I think. Uh, on Wednesday or Thursday, St. Jude sued both uh, 
MedSec and MediWaters. They sued them, right? They sued them for publishing the security vulnerabilities inside the code. And they said, what was the reason that they gave? What, what was the reason of the lawsuit? So they said it was defamation because these weren't really um, um, security vulnerabilities. These were made up. No, I want to, I want to, uh, okay. I don't want to rephrase that in English, but where does it start? This liability start, that I can move the liability to whomever I want. Well, it's a vicious circle. Okay. Let's, let, we'll talk about that after. We'll talk about, okay. So, so anyways, so they sued them. They sued, they sued St. Jude's for, for, for publishing um, a vulnerability that they said wasn't a real vulnerability. It was just thing. They could have sued them also under these laws, under these anti-circumvention laws, because they had a medical device and they had circumvented the, 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 the controls inside the device. Why didn't they do that? Why didn't they sue them under, um, under these laws? It's a good question, and there's a lot of uh, discussion about that. Why not? Maybe it's because they didn't want the security community to, to be on, on, on the other side of the lawsuit to say no, we, we, we the, the, these laws are not good laws, and we don't support the lawsuit. It, it's a good question, but uh, some people think that they may, in the end, also sue them under these laws. Um, here's another case. Someone, uh, I, I'm going to run through this quickly. A Russian programmer presented. Um, he came to the United States and he presented. Uh, um, a presentation about ebook security and how you could uh, get around the ebook security, and then the FBI arrested him because he, uh, this was a long time ago, this was in 2001. And then Russia said, don't, programmers shouldn't travel to the United States, it's too dangerous. Um, under these laws again. Anyways, so these kind of laws are all over the world. We said they're in the United States, they're in Europe. There's an international treaty, the White Pole Copyright Treaty, that says basically everyone that signed this treaty has to make these laws in their country. Um, and here is 90 something countries, basically almost every important country in the world that has signed this treaty and that has laws. And you'll see that Israel is on the top of the second column. So you think that Israel should have these laws also, and no, it's not true. Israel signed the treaty, signed the treaty, but in Israel there are no laws like this because Israel, even though they signed it, the treaty has to pass in the Knesset, and the Knesset decided that they're not going to pass this law. Um, there are no laws like this in the United States, in Israel, and the case went up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court decided uh, it was a case where someone was uh, was where the the signal for the Mondial was uh, broadcast over over the satellite, and they decrypted the signal, and uh, that person was sued, and they said, here you're decrypting the signal, you're circumventing the the encryption. And uh, there are these laws all over the world, and we can see you under these laws. And no, there are no laws like that in Israel. So these laws apply all. Um, He, he didn't copy it. Maybe there were also copyright issues in the case, but this person didn't copy it. The case was about the decryption, the decryption of the signal. Th there could have been other instances of copyright, but in, about the decryption of the signal, the Supreme Court said that, that it was permitted under Israel. In Israel, you're allowed to decrypt signals, and there's really, you know, as long as you don't also violate the copyright, it's okay to decrypt the signals, and there's nothing that anyone can do about it. They can't sue you about it in Israel. So. What, what does this mean in Israel? Does this mean, how, how has this impact? So these laws are all over the world, um, in every other country. In every other country, the security community complains. These laws are affecting us. We can't examine devices. We can't pen test. We can't do this. They're so, it, 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 it impacts how we can research in our field. In Israel, there are no laws like this. Has this impacted any industry in Israel? Any of this is hypersecurity in Israel? And as far as I can tell, the answer is no. It has not made a difference. So if someone else can tell me something different, I, I'd be happy to know. But in, so far in Israel, there are no laws like this at all. It's the only uh, um, developed country in the world where that, that is like that. So one answer is that none of this matters. <laughs> that the laws don't matter. People violate them elsewhere. People violate them in Israel. Um, that, that's one option. The other option is that people, uh, even in Israel, um, think that it's, that it's a problem and therefore they... Uh, they uh, 
they, they don't uh, circumvent the laws. Another, another, you know, uh, uh, so that, that could be, but I don't think that, that large companies like Google and Facebook and Microsoft that are in Israel really think that way. So another possibility is that, is that a lot of the Israeli cybersecurity is connected to the defense industry and these laws often don't apply to the defense industry or to security or to the police or to things like that. That's one option. Another option is that it's hard. It's hard for a big company to say, you know what, only in the United States I won't do these kind of things. In Israel, I'll do it. And uh, my employees in, is in the United States won't be involved in these kind of uh, anti-circumvention activities. My employees in Israel can do it. It's, they, it's very hard to draw those distinctions. And big companies just say, it's, it, no one can do it. No one can do this kind of uh, research. And another um, option is that, like as people said before, that uh, trafficking, selling code that, 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 that circumvents these things is, uh, is, is illegal. So if you develop something in Israel that's circumventing and then you sell it into the United States, even though you actually didn't develop in the United States, it's still illegal. And maybe that stops people in Israel from doing these kind of activities or, stop or, or make, makes the lack of these laws not important for the cybersecurity industry in Israel. Um, so, um, I said I'd give you some practical tips, right? So why not? Um, so if you do decide to do some hacking or to investigate your iPhone, so in Israel, it's probably okay. You don't have to worry about it. But if you're in another country or you want to investi investigate in Israel and publish it on the web, and on the web they can see it in the United States, so it can be a problem. So then, um, some things that you should do is, first of all, you should do it in a controlled environment. So if you're hacking medical devices, don't hack the medical device. Don't have to hack the pacemaker that in someone's body. Hack a pacemaker on the table to make sure it doesn't affect anyone. That's, that's one thing. Um, make sure that you're really doing it to promote safety. Don't infringe copyrights. Um, make sure that your disclosure is reasonable. Right? Don't start disclosing it on, uh, and selling the disclosure for money unless the company has a bug bounty, but don't, don't, don't uh, extort the company for the disclosure. And uh, if you're going to be selling the devices, so selling is a bigger problem, so talk to a lawyer. Don't start selling um, the software that circumvents devices. And that's it. If anyone has uh, any insights, I'd be happy to hear. It, it, it is an issue. You know, the United States has this report that every year they re report on the countries that don't have enough intellectual property enforcement. So, it, so every year the United States says, uh, you, know, you know, the fact that Israel doesn't have these laws is not, you know, there are people that don't like it that Israel doesn't have these laws, but there are also a lot of people that think it's a, it's a good thing not to have these laws. There's a lot of pushback against these laws because in the end it means that if you have an iPhone, you can't experiment with it. Or if you have content, you, there are things that you can't do with, your things that, with, with, the, with the software or the content that you bought and you own yourself. So there's a lot of, there's a, there's a reasonable position to be made in the world that these laws are not only good and that they harm a lot of beneficial activity. And Israel has taken that position. That's what it said. Every time the United States complains that Israel doesn't have these laws, its response and has, made, has responded publicly that it doesn't think that these are good laws. These are not protecting intellectual property. It's, 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 it's harming, it's stopping people from using their own property and devices in the way that they think that they should be able to use it. So it's, it's a reasonable position for Israel to take. It's not just that it's not enforcing intellectual property and that's the position it has taken. What? I can put whatever uh, default password I want in order. That's, uh, that's I, I, no, I agree. I, I agree. That, and that's, and that's, the, that's one of the arguments against these kind of laws because once they, they prevent people from actually investigating what's inside the product, whether it's good security or bad security. And if these laws didn't exist, then it would be easier for people to investigate the products. And that's why you have these exemptions like the security testing exemption and things like that. Whether they actually work, it's hard to know. 
but that's that's the argument against these kind of laws, and that's why you have the exceptions. So it's never been tried. It's never been tried. Um, most of the time, what happens is, so, so the exceptions have recently been made stronger. But until they were made stronger, it's never been tried. And what's always been happened is that someone's investigated something and tried to disclose it. And they've been threatened with a lawsuit. And either they did it anyways, or, and they weren't sued. Or they decided not to disclose it, and it wasn't uh, it wasn't uh, it wasn't important enough for them, and they just decided they're not going to disclose it because it's not worth the threat of the lawsuit. So it's never been tested really in the court. Either people have decided they're not going to disclose the vulnerabilities, or the companies have decided that it's not worth the bad press. Because when people, I mean, legal, if the, the legal answer to that, the straight and narrow legal answer to that is because when people sign up for Facebook, for example, and they post information on Facebook, they agree to their terms of service. And those terms of service says that Facebook can do what it wants with the information that you posted there. And if you're a security researcher, no one's agreed to your terms of service. And so it's, uh, that, that's the straight answer. Okay. Uh. Uh, so there are laws about that. There are laws about that in every country. They're usually complicated, and they're complicated to understand. And and it's not it's not a question that I could I could answer just off the top of my head memorizing memorizing what it says. You have to you have to think about it. But there are, in Israel there are there's the copyright law and there's an exception for reverse engineering. And uh, in the United States there's an exception and the exception is stronger in, in, in Europe. But there are those exceptions in the world. Um, you have to really dive into it and start taking it apart. So it, you have to be careful when you do things like that. You have to be careful. Uh, one, one thing is you could be sued under these kind of laws. You could be sued under copyright laws. Um, it's a problem. You have to think about, you have to think about it when you, uh, when, you, when you start doing things like that. You have to be careful. I wouldn't, because you could end up, you, you have to be careful that it's not defamation like the Hara. You have to be careful about that, that it's a real vulnerability and that it's, I'm, I'm okay? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so you have to be careful. You have to be sure that it's a real vulnerability. These laws won't bother. You have to be careful that you're not hacking into someone else's computer in order to disclose the vulnerability. Once you're hacking into someone else's computer and now your own computer, then uh, you come under different laws. But you won't be. Uh, but if you're hacking your own iPhone and you disclose it in Israel, then under these laws you won't have a problem. But you know, I'm not giving legal advice here, so talk to me <laughs> if that's a real. <laughs> if, if you disclose it everywhere, then in the United, you know, if you put it up on the internet, then it's that's right. Could be, could be. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.